By the way, oops, if there's any questions, you can go ahead and ask them and interrupt me, you know, reserve the right to postpone the question if, it's, uh, if it gets in the way. Yeah. Well, you formulated a little different than I'm used to hearing. Usually, uh, when they talk about overproduction and yet shortages within the society, they say due to the mode of operation of the capitalist system and the, uh, the taking away of the surplus value that the worker creates in the form of profit, rent, and, and, and interest, the worker or the, all the producers cannot buy back the quantum of goods they throw out of the market. Therefore, uh, pressure is created to find markets elsewhere, mm -hmm. but the working class itself can never buy back the productive things that they throw in the market. Mm -hmm. And you formulated it a little differently. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's all. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. That okay. clarifies our money so far. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I'm sure you agree with that. That due to the fact that the the uh, rentier and the capitalists take their profit and the landlord his rent out of the surplus value created by the worker, they can't possibly, the masses can't buy back the goods that they created. Mm -hmm. And that creates a shortage for them, a surfeit mm -hmm. for the home market. And usually that leads to in investing overseas. Well, let, let me stop you right there. I actually wanted to make a, a more simple point. Instead of talking about where this crisis, you said overproduction, might have come from, first of all, I just want to point out what an absurd situation that is. Something that people take for granted, that there's factories that are empty, unemployment, over a uh, surfeit of houses, etc. To really grasp the fact that an economic crisis itself is an indictment of capitalism. Only in this economy can there be too much wealth. Too much wealth not for the needs of the people, but for the purpose of turning money into more money. The crisis in that sense really clearly demonstrates, or you could say it casts an especially glaring light on the fact that all wealth in this economy and the needs of the people are subordinated to that purpose, turning money into more money. And that's something that the crisis itself teaches us. And the second point I wanted to make was to say, regardless of theories of overproduction or something like that, one thing that the crisis itself demonstrates is clear. A credit crunch, a lack of borrowed money, means that goods can't be produced. Now, if you think of how the general public has normally reacted to this, it's with the hope that banks will be able to provide loans again soon. The poor real economy is suffering. It's not able to produce goods for people. It's not able to create jobs for people, the things people want and need, because the banks aren't providing loans. The argument I want to make is the very fact that the so-called real economy can be affected by something like a lack of borrowed money proves that the purpose of that real economy is no different from the banks that their purpose is identical, turning a sum of money into more money. That's what credit is useful for, and that's why a lack of credit is so fatal. Not a reason to cry for the producers, but a reason to get clear about what produce producers actually pursue, uh, the interests that producers actually pursue in this economy. I want to make a further point on that note. What the crisis has taught us is that credit is not only a useful means, not only a convenience. If a lack of credit means bringing the entire process of production to a halt, then credit is obviously an indispensable means. As soon as firms no longer get access to credit, the capital they may have, the sources of wealth they may have, are useless. That teaches us that capitalists in this economy have long been doing business with means that go beyond their past business success. Go beyond their past business success. Yeah, they're investing money that don't arrive from their past proceeds, but from credit themselves. Their credit itself. One could express it, capitalists are always living beyond their means in order to get bigger and to make what was beyond their means now within their means. That's the way they grow. Okay, that might not be a big secret, but what does that teach us? If capitalists, if the money capitalists have to do business is useless without additional borrowed money, without credit, that tells us that the means of producing this economy, not goods, not means of production, but rather debts. That's a remarkable thing. Most people try to avoid debts. It's a bad thing to be in debt. 
If you're in debt to a bank, it's a problem you have to deal with, a situation you want to avoid. But as far as the economy, as far as the business world goes, the real dominant producers, one could also say the purpose of production, debt are the lifeblood of the economy. Debt that function as capital. That is the wealth of a capitalist nation. Therefore, even if the business of companies, or even the business of companies that produce the most tangible goods, toothpaste, water bottles, etc., you can think of all kinds of useful goods, even their business is a speculation on the future. In that sense, no different from the banks. If there is no anticipation of future success, let's say no confidence in future success, no credit, then there's no production. The most tangible business in the real economy is the speculative of the banks. Again, therefore it's wrong to draw a distinction between bad speculators on the one hand, good, solid, capitalists on the other hand, who produce useful things. Be it their own, be 
he is the buying power of the working class. They always grow at, at a pace that is determined by the credit they can get and the accumulation they already have made and not determined by the size of the well, all of the whole of the buying power of the nation. And but maybe there's a simple answer to the question of why is there overproduction? The simple answer is because not consumption is the purpose of production, but accumulation is the purpose of production. Maybe this this would be a simple answer. And uh, I'd say we we, we terminate this, uh, this point, and if we like to, we come back in the end, uh, at the end of the uh, entire talk and uh, have a look at a, let's say, more elaborated explanation of this. But it was just the uh, intervention in the sense of the, the mere fact that the working class is exploited and by definition, can buy back what it what it produces. This can be the reason for a crisis. That would also be for deal with that after the talk. It's a, yeah. a difficult enough issue, and it's definitely worth getting into. So we'll reserve some time for that. <coughs> first, I just want to summarize the first real lesson, a real valuable lesson that the crisis teaches us. It's no secret that when the business of banks, or if banks aren't healthy, and if profit making suffers, then the people itself, especially the working class, are doomed. No opportunity to earn a living, or a much worse opportunity to earn a living. That's not a secret to anyone, it's something that many people have to experience. But what conclusion do they normally draw from that? They draw the conclusion, because I am dependent upon the health of the banks, and the functioning of profit making. Then I insist that everything be done so that that works again and my dependency works out. That I can have a chance to have a job again. Because I'm dependent upon that, it must be good for me. It's there for my sake. And what I want to say is the crisis itself teaches a different lesson. The conclusion we should draw from the crisis is that the economic aims of the people, the economic aims of the working class, are, is not the economic aim of this economy. Their reason for going to get work, to earn a livelihood, that's not the purpose of this economy. The purpose of this economy is turning money into more money. And if that doesn't work, well then it's worth throwing them out on the street. Another way of putting the same point, if people only have jobs and labor is only performed, if money can be turned into more money, then that's what their labor is good for. That's the purpose of them going to work, to produce profit, not to work for themselves. That might be their subjective reason for doing it, but that's not the objective reason. Okay, move on to the second point. I want to get into a little bit about the business of the banks themselves, the business of the banking system. What does the crisis teach us about the business that goes on in the financial sector, in the financial industry? Ever since the financial crisis has broken out, we've learned that, we've learned from politicians and the press, that banks provide a crucial service to the economy, that they are the most crucial service provider in this economy. And the crucial service that they provide, like I've said tonight, is providing loans to the real economy. Providing loans to the real economy that allows it to create the goods and the services that we all need and want. But the crisis itself teaches us what a peculiar kind of service that is and a peculiar kind of service provider. Can anybody name another service provider that or where the situation is such that when that service provider is no longer there or reduces his service, then the recipient of the service is ruined. 